much, uh, Professor, for joining us this morning on DD India. Uh, just a while back, we were showing details and updates on Prime Minister's visit uh, to the U.S., and we show, showed the high points of the historic uh, address of the Prime Minister to uh, the, the, to the uh, to the house there. Having said this, now this is not for the first time that the Prime Minister is visiting the U.S., but we've seen many firsts of its kinds that have been seen during this visit. But, you know, we've enlisted that as well. But how does this uh, visit of the Prime Minister is, in fact, is different from the ones which he has had previously? And what have been uh, the high points of the visit so far? I think answer uh, Preeti to this question was provided by Prime Minister himself. Uh, he said when I came last time to address the joint session of US Congress, India then was not the fifth largest yes. economy of the earth and not projected to become within five to eight years the actually third largest economy of the world. And so I think fundamentally for Americans that is the core interest that they are engaging a very rapidly growing economy, which is where all their partnerships are going to be greatly beneficial for the United States and their companies. Of course, India also stands to gain, not just in terms of prestige of being recognized as an emerging power, uh, but also in terms of access to modern technologies, uh, defense equipment, partnerships in not just joint production but research and development in very, very critical technologies like semiconductors, rare arts. So in that sense, the complementarity of the relationship I think is what is completely different uh, compared to Prime Minister's uh, visits that we have seen before. And of course, if we talk of geopolitics, then the whole uh, the tension between China and India, the continuation of Ukraine war, uh, Russia and China getting closer to each other could also be then seen as new triggers or new factors which are making okay. this visit different than the last one. Uh, Professor Swan Singh, good morning, uh, Anil, this side. Looking at, uh, you know, especially uh, when it comes to the H-1B visa, also the two consulates that are go to be opened by the United States in India and India opening a consulate in Seattle, especially when it comes to the bedrock of relations, do you see these two steps, uh, you know, taking this relationship to a new highs? Uh, very clearly, again, uh, to quote Prime Minister, uh, Indians living in America are the bridge of bilateral relationship. True. And uh, how comfortable and how successful they are uh, also has direct impact on bilateral relations. And of course, this H1B visa, which is issued uh, annually to about half a million people, uh, had a large number of Indians who use this visa. And uh, there were, of course, difficulties, particularly during the pandemic period when some of these people had to come back and uh, reapply uh, to renew their H-1B visa. And then, then these were hiccups during pandemic, particularly that were felt uh, by Indian side and were conveyed to America uh, repeatedly. So I think they have at least a pilot project to begin at least certain number of those working under H-1B uh, should be able to renew visa in the United States and numbers could be increased in coming times then. So it's fundamentally to facilitate contribution of uh, highly skilled Indians who are actually contributing to American economy and of course uh, also uh, adding to certain advantage of uh, opportunities for Indians and links with India. And of course to make that even more easier, the fact that the United States will be now opening two new consulates uh, in Ahmedabad and Bangalore. Okay. Uh, and of course, India also opening one in Seattle is continuation of building stronger connect between our people. And these are two democracies and stronger connect of their people is stronger connect between states. Okay. All right, Professor. Uh, when we talk of uh, the Prime Minister uh, addressing the joint session there and also talking of how India has progressed, how India has not only moved, you know, it, it is the movement of India, the progress of India faster that has been highlighted by the Prime Minister. Uh, you know, what picture does it throw to the world of uh, the progress or the or the prosperity which India has been doing back home and, you, and the Prime Minister also giving a call for uh, this not being an era of war but of dialogue and diplomacy, put all this together. How strongly do you see this address of the Prime Minister, uh, you know, further positioning India on the global page? 
Now, I think repeatedly <clears throat> in the last uh, nine years of uh, being Prime Minister of India, uh, he has repeatedly spoken of India's democratic and demographic advantage. Uh, so, India being a young population, I think itself gives enormous confidence to both leaders in India and people in India, but also to the world how India is growing and how India will continue to, to grow in coming times. And in his speech only, I think the way he really made his assessment of where the relationship is going, he said not even the sky is limit for what the two nations, the two largest democracies can do, not only for direct relations, but largely also to build global peace, global prosperity, and ensure stability in international relations. So the relationship is no longer limited only to you know, advantage to America and India, it has really an impact on how international politics is conducted and how global governance is evolved over a period of time. So in that sense, the United States already has major, uh, other major players as uh, alliance partners. China, of course, is another emerging country, but the United States sees China as an adversary. So India is the you know, only perhaps rising major power that the United States wishes to also you know, bring closer and then build stronger partnerships and that is a great attraction for India. And the visit clearly is a recognition of that new stature of India in that sense in global affairs. Okay. Uh, Professor Swan Singh, when, uh, uh, you know, on the same lines when the Prime Minister spoke in the US uh, Congress, uh, do you get the sense the Prime Minister, you know, once again reiterating, taking that, uh, you know, cue forward from Preeti on dialogue and diplomacy, but also indicating that India will not be dragged into the Russia-Ukraine crisis come what may? Uh, I think you're right. I think uh, if you notice how India has approached this, what I call proactive neutrality on Ukraine crisis or Ukraine war, uh, it has been proactive because, you know, while India has stood its ground and continued to import crude oil from Russia, India has also constantly been engaged in supplying humanitarian assistance to Ukraine people. Mm. And of course, at various levels, including Prime Minister himself and Foreign Minister and others, at various levels, trying to engage leaders on both sides, in Ukraine and Russia, to make sure that dialogue is the way. And repeatedly, once uh, in summer, can you remember Indian Prime Minister mentioned to President Putin that this era is not an era of war. That has become a kind of a mantra in international relations since then quoted by several leaders in various speeches, including in the United Nations. This was part of the Bali uh, G20 summit final declaration. And of course, now at the G summit, uh, G7 meeting in Tokyo uh, earlier this year, uh, Prime Minister, you know, again said something which was again noticed strongly, that perhaps the status quo should not be unilaterally altered. Of course, this had also certain indication to what China is doing on the border with India. But India has been proactively involved in making efforts and pushing repeatedly that dialogue is the way to build peace and this is not an era of war. And in that sense, India has been able to carve out a space for itself in asserting itself as a civilizational state able to contribute to international narratives. And you see that assertion in, in foreign policy really becoming increasingly not just noticeable, but also gaining certain amount of credibility and respect in the international community. All right. Uh, also, uh, Professor, the Prime Minister uh, vehemently called for, you know, a vision of a f uh, free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. This is not something, uh, this is in fact something which has been repeatedly emphasized uh, by India. Uh, having said that, uh, a free and inclusive Indo-Pacific has also been echoed by the US on multiple fora as well. Uh, how strong does uh, this commitment of both the countries uh, go for, uh, given the uh, way China has been trying to uh, uh, to be to appear more assertive in the region? I think the way, for a long period of time, India's vision <coughs> was limited to Indian Ocean, but as India started growing, it started looking itself not limited to the region called South Asia, but limited to larger region of Southern Asia. And it was during uh, Prime Minister Adil Bihari Vajpayee's time that the strategic space of India was defined from Persian Gulf to South China Sea. So in that sense, India has over a period of time revised and revisited 
where it sees itself located and of course when the united states and other friends of the united states started discussing a new narrative of indo pacific uh, that was their effort to bring india into that uh, larger geopolitics to in that sense uh, ensure certain restraint on china and china not being able to behave but uh, you know sort of by defying international norms and india has found itself uh, completely engaged in indo pacific narratives and initiatives including the quadrilateral security framework there are two important speeches one that was made by prime minister in shangri la dialogue in june of 2018 okay and last year foreign minister made a speech in chulalongkorn university in bangkok which explains india's vision now very quickly the point i'm making here is that again india is not bandwagoning in indo pacific as to exactly what united states would like india to do particularly that was uh, the situation during uh, president donald trump for presidency india has clearly said two important things in indo pacific india would not like to see the region militarized and second india would not like to see any exclusive group of nations really controlling the whole region so <clears throat> there is a talk of a quad plus which includes vietnam south korea new zealand and also talk of quad plus plus indeed all major countries around the world have issued in last 2 to 3 years their strategy papers on indo pacific Okay, which Perhaps. is emerging as the is the most important region, and India is engaged in that most important region. Uh, Professor Swan Singh, uh, once again, when India talks about uh, especially a full membership to the African Union in the G20, India once again advocating that it is truly the voice of the global South when it presents this point in the U.S. Congress. Indeed, I think that is going to be India's uh, sort of uh, pioneering contribution to the very structure of uh, G20 nations when it has the presidency of G20. Africa is the growth focus of the future, both again demographic and of course economic productivity. Uh, in the second half of this century, I think Africa will be the kind of growth center and epic center of uh, global trends. and that is being increasingly understood by most nations and when india today is seen as a voice for the global south you remember in january india had hosted a global south summit and india wants to make sure that the voice of the global south india is able to take to the higher platforms like g20 or united nations or g7 and other places and in that sense india was once you remember the leader of non aligned nations developing nations uh, now it's a it's a relatively similar uh, situation that india today wants to be the voice for the global south and one concrete initiative that india is trying to take is to ensure that african union just like european union is seen as part of g20 uh, african union should also be seen as part of g20 and it should sit there because g20 has to look at the global macro global governance uh, of at least financial and economic trends and if the growth epic center in the second half of the century is going to be africa it is better that we are engaged with africa and working with them for whether it is the sdg sustainable development goals which are the, having a, a target of 2030 or africa has its own target of 2063 again so the certain blending of initiatives of g20 with africa is significant and if india is able to ensure that african union joins G20 and G20 becomes G21. That would be seen as a very pioneering contribution of India's presidency in transforming the very structure of G20 to 21, uh, which will be really you know future centric and future oriented in that sense. Mm. And I think that's going to be an excellent uh, contribution that India can make during its presidency of G20. Uh, Professor, uh, it was in 2014 when the Prime Minister made his first uh, visit. Uh, to the U.S. as the Prime Minister of the country, and over the nine years of governance, he has uh, had many visits to the U.S. He has seen, you know, he has in fact dealt with three presidents, three regimes there. Uh, let us understand from you how has the relationship between U.S. and India grown over these years, despite the different regimes, the different presidents the Prime Minister has dealt with. That's an excellent question, Preeti. I think what is significant to understand in what is new and what is different in India-U.S. relations today is the bipartisan support. So it doesn't matter which party is in control of power in United States. Both parties want to engage in India. And one good example of that, if you have seen the letter of invitation 
that came from Indian Prime Minister to address the joint session of U.S. Congress. It was signed by leaders of both political parties, minority and majority leaders in Senate and House of Representatives, including, of course, the House Speaker. And four leaders signing that letter of invitation to Indian Prime Minister was a reflection that it is across the board now that the United States political elite uh, wants to engage India very seriously. And one very significant point that the Prime Minister also made in his speech to the joint uh, session of U.S. Congress is to see how people of Indian origin are becoming part and parcel of the political elite in the United States. And he referred to Kamala Harris sitting behind him saying that she has made history uh, by being a person of Indian origin and now being the Vice President of the United States. And of course also referred to several other uh, delegates uh, sitting in the House uh, who are uh, uh, both either in the Senate or House of Representatives. So I think that across board consensus in the United States that engaging India is in the national interest of the United States, I think to be that to me uh, is something that gives enormous confidence that whatever new initiatives are being taken, they will not be disrupted. And you mentioned Indian Prime Minister has already dealt with three presidents, yes. President Obama, Donald Trump and now President Joe Biden. So irrespective of which political party comes to power, India's relationship and partnership with the United States and expectations from both sides in that sense would be carried out to, 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 to the ultimate where they want to go. Professor Swan Singh, when one takes a look at especially, you know, the meetings that uh, Prime Ministers had with business <laughs> honchos from top U.S. companies, uh, do you somewhere get the sense that, uh, you know, Prime Minister seems to be a mission mode, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, replacing China as the new world factory? Uh, I think that is uh, uh, a comparison often made uh, by several experts that India is perhaps going to replicate, uh, repeat what uh, China was doing for the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, and to some extent, that can also be seen if you notice the growth rates that India has uh, kind of uh, shown in the last 10 and 15 years. Uh, Indian economy is really uh, leapfrogging in many sectors. But particularly the point that I wish to make when it comes to digital technologies, green technologies, advanced and critical technologies, it is not just that it's going to be one way street of United States helping India by supplying advanced and critical technologies. Uh, Many sectors would see India also contributing and helping the United States and pandemic showed, for example, how India was able to use a platform like COVID. Uh, and you have heard that the foreign minister making uh, sort of uh, mentions of how when he was visiting the United States, you know, somebody said, do you have a certificate? And he said certificate on his phone. Uh, so in that sense, people in India, the way they were engaged in providing free vaccines uh, you know, about two plus billion uh, doses of vaccines given freely by the state. So in that sense, whether it is uh, advanced technologies, uh, critical technologies, digital technologies, green technologies, transition to uh, clean energy uh, and all these things, I think India also can make uh, enormous contribution to how United States uh, would also be implementing its own targets. Both of them have targets of, for becoming carbon neutral, for example. United States wants to be carbon neutral by 2050. India wants to be carbon neutral by 2070, partly because our industrialization growth is still at a different stage compared to the United States. So we are taking slightly two decades more than the United States. So in that sense, complementarity and cooperation is two-sided. And I think the way Prime Minister meets these CEOs of leading companies in the United States is to clear the air as to whether they will have any hiccups when they come in India or okay. uh, the follow-up process when they want to invest in India. So the personal assurance that Prime Minister wishes to give to some of these uh, CEOs uh, is something which is uh, perhaps going to be helping in giving them confidence that if they wish to invest in this rising economy called India, uh, at the base of it, they want to look at per dollar returns for their companies. And I think okay. that is what is being assured. Okay. Uh, Professor Swan Singh, we've got more voices there coming from the United States.